Treasurer Wayne Swan there. Well, for more on the mining tax debate, I'm joined by our political editor in Canberra, Lyndall Curtis. So, Lyndall, this definitely is not a done deal just yet. It's not a done deal just yet. The Prime Minister's talking to some of the independents today about what they want. Tony Windsor wants changes to, uh, to look more at things like coal seam gas. Andrew Wilkie <coughs> wants some changes as well. And Tony Crooks foreshadowed amendments too. So there are still some negotiations to be done before the tax is voted on in the lower house, maybe Wednesday or Thursday. But also, Joe, uh, business has raised concerns about the superannuation changes that go along with the minerals resource rent tax. And to discuss those, I've been been joined by the Assistant Treasurer, Bill Shorten. Welcome to News 24. Good morning. Business has raised concerns about the super changes, worried that, that they will be a cost on business. That will be the case, won't it? It'll be either business paying for them or workers foregoing wage rises to increase super from 9 to 12 per cent. Well, let's be clear. We've got a real-life experiment about what happens when you increase superannuation. Some in business are saying that, oh, it'll increase the cost of business. I would submit to them that the evidence of the increases when superannuation went from 3% to 9%. Let's have a look at what happened to business in that time period between 1992 and 2002. So that was a 6% increase over 10 years. We're proposing a 3% increase over 7 years. So it's not an unreasonable comparison. What happened is that uh, business profits of a share of GDP went up. Unit labour costs went down. Uh, what happened was that it was absorbed as part of real wage increases. So my message to business is it is not going to add additional cost to business. Also, the way it's structured by the government, there's seven instalments. The first instalment in 2013-14 will be quarter of a percent quarter of a percent, the second instalment quarter of a percent, the remaining five instalments annually up to 2018-19 will be half a percent. Businesses can absorb this as part of the inevitable real wage increase as they provide their workforce. But it essentially means for workers that, that it is real wage increases, some of that goes into superannuation, so, so effectively that wage increase is delayed? Well, what happens when you increase the uh, real wages of workers and a portion of it goes into compulsory savings is that portion which goes into compulsory savings savings has an anti-inflationary effect. If you pump everything just into wage rises, then that puts greater pressure on inflation. But if part of the real wage increase is going into deferred savings, then it has an anti-inflationary impact and dampens pressure on interest rates and inflation. So I think that uh, increasing compulsory savings, it's good in the short term because it has an anti-inflationary effect. It doesn't come off the bottom line of business because it's just part of the inevitable real wages, and we've got a lot of historical evidence to prove that. But in the medium to longer term, the idea that not paying superannuation somehow avoids uh, a cost to the society is wrong. Because as we grow older, won't the age pension increase? At least this stops greater reliance on the age pension. There are no free lunches. So if you, if you say the evidence is that business doesn't pay for it, that, that it's economically good in the longer term. Why is business raising these concerns? Well, some in business are. I think most in business can see the sense in having a large pool of domestic savings. Australia has domestic savings which are greater than our GDP annually. That makes us very unusual for a Western country. We're very unusual that we have this large pool of savings. That makes the Australian economy stronger. It means there's more money to invest in Australia. Uh, the rest of the world's envious. So some in business don't like it but that's because they're being conservative. The reality is that long-term compulsory savings uh, assists the taxpayer without, because you don't have to pay so much in the age pension. It assists the pool of national investment, and it means that people will have money saved where otherwise they just simply wouldn't have saved the money. Now, all this is dependent <coughs> on the mining tax going through the parliament. It, it'll, it's hoped, from the government's perspective, to go through the House of Reps this year and the Senate next year. Will it go through this week? Oh, I, the mining tax is a good idea. The idea that the richest companies in the world should pay a tax to the nation whose resources they're exploiting, which won't be there for our kids and our grandkids, this is a good idea. The mining boom's a great thing, but it's leading to a very uneven economy. Uh, you just ask a small business person in Perth or Brisbane or Melbourne who's running a domestic tourism operation, domestic manufacturing, domestic education services, relying on overseas students. Our dollar has been pumped up quite high with the high commodity prices. So we're seeing the mining boom causes some negative effects in the economy. What we're doing is using some of the profits from the mining tax to help reinvest in infrastructure, to reinvest in money for small business, all small business in Australia, and to pay for the tax concessions of superannuation.
negotiation. But you haven't yet got all the independents you need signed up to it, have you? Well, I know that negotiations are still underway, uh, but what I also know is that good ideas normally triumph. This is a good idea. And you, you think it will triumph this week? I'm optimistic, but of course we'll wait until um, all the negotiations are concluded. But I haven't really seen any knockout arguments coming from um, the Liberals. They say that they want to give $11 billion in the next four years back to the richest companies in the world. That's not popular. Um, we saw Mr Forrest, who runs Fortescue, boasting about never paying tax. I think that'll make a lot of people annoyed. So I do think that um, there is an appetite in the community to share the profits of the mining boom nationally, and I think uh, all members of Parliament, not just the crossbenchers, but there's plenty of Liberals who privately concede that the mining tax is a pretty reasonable idea. There wasn't the appetite <coughs> in the public when this mining tax was first proposed by Kevin Rudd. What, did, did you simply get the politics of that wrong at that time? Well, clearly we had to make sure that we consult with industry. That has happened. Uh, Minister Martin Ferguson and uh, a number of prominent business people, Don Argus and others, have worked through a lot of the issues. Uh, there's been a lot of consultation from when the idea was first announced to now. So I think that um, a lot more of the um, stars are aligned this time. And finally, if I could just ask you about Qantas, the, the 21 days for bargaining set by Fair Work Australia is up today, <coughs> but it doesn't seem yet that the parties are, are close to striking a deal. What will happen if, if no deal is struck by the end of today? Oh, well, what will happen is, uh, and let's not assume a deal can't be struck today, but if there isn't one, uh, there can either be another 21 days period of negotiation or there can be arbitration. It's possible for any party to dispute the requirement to the decision of the independent umpire to uh, terminate the industrial action by Qantas and the unions. Uh, I think there will be a deal. Whether or not it's today or next week, there will be a deal. Uh, whether or not it's by conciliation or arbitration, there will be a deal. Bargaining is not easy, uh, and I've noticed some in um, business and some in the unions just simply say, oh, well, we should just have more arbitration. Well, bargaining has never been easy, but and this is not an easy issue. You've got, on one hand, the legitimate expectations of a whole lot of workers. You say, we contribute to this marvellous brand of Qantas. We want job security and, and fair remuneration. On the other hand, the leadership of Qantas is saying we're competing in a global environment. They'll strike a deal. Of that, I have no doubt. Is it better, though, that, that a deal is struck between the parties than it goes to arbitration? Or, or is the prospect, if it goes to arbitration and that is successful, that other businesses may use that route? Well, I don't think many employers are going to copy Alan Joyce. Just grounding a whole airline, I think, has left a lot in business, whilst at one level they might superficially say, oh, that's right, you're being tough and strong. You know, in a big retail operation like Qantas, I think a lot of other people will be saying, surely there's a better way to do business than ground your airline. But what's happened has happened. Uh, what the government's focused on is making sure that um, the flying public are not inconvenienced in the way they were two weekends ago. Uh, beyond that, I've got no doubt that the system means that there'll be an outcome, either by negotiation, conciliation or by arbitration, but there will be a deal. Bill Shorten, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And back to you, Joe. Little, just